How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to On The Ball. Welcome back to another episode of Review The Prem. And you guys are very lucky today because, again, you're getting a double trouble from us today. Review The Prem, followed by Predict The Prem, which will come a bit later today. But as you can see on the top corner of your screens, it's 353 to Sim, 345 to me. And the way the scoring works, it's five points for a completely correct scoreline, one point for a correct result. And once you pick the man in terms of star man, you can't pick them again for the rest of the season and it's five points for a goal two points for an assist and let's get in to the midweek action We're starting off at St James's Park which finished Newcastle 1 Everton 1 Sim went for 2-1 I went for 3-1 both in the favour of Newcastle uh, but Everton uh, went to St James's Park and got a point I think um Isaac put them in the lead quite early on. And I think um, Newcastle probably had the better of it, but Everton definitely had their own chances in the game. And uh, second half, they very much came into it with a nice counter-attacking game and they got their reward at the end with the penalty. Um, Newcastle will feel aggrieved that they didn't go and uh, win this game. Yeah, it could be a very big, big point for Everton in the battle for relegation. Obviously, um, now a bit of breathing space. There's a four-point gap between uh, them and Luton now, who currently sit in 18th, and Everton have a game in hand as well. Um, the worrying thing for Everton is despite it being a good point and obviously there, it was a last minute penalty pretty much from um, Dominic Calvert-Lewin who I think he breaks his goal scoring duck he hasn't scored in a, a long long time so he'll need that confidence boost and the fact as well they went 1-0 down early and were able to claw back, claw back a point is positive but still no win since December and actually if you look at their season as a whole they had a bad start to the season didn't they um, mm -hmm. lost their like, first few games and then they had the points deduction announcement. Uh, so, and after that points deduction announcement, they went on a really good run. I think they won like five and six games or something like that. But now they haven't won since December. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder how Sean Dyche is feeling in terms of his job. I know he won't get sacked before the end of the season. But going into next season, I, I do see a lot of disgruntlement by a lot of Everton fans of the way they're playing, their lack of um, kind of risk-taking. They're always uh, looking to be defensively solid. He's basically turned them into um, the Merseyside Burnley, essentially. Um, so I don't know if... Uh, the Everton fan, look, they, they, I'm, they're pretty sure they will stay up and th that will probably be a good achievement considering the points deduction. But I do wonder going forward whether Sh Sean Dyche is the long-term fit for Everton. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I always thought Sean Dyche is the best guy for Everton in terms of trying to keep them in the league, but they need to be having ambitions more than that, you know, trying to get up the table. Will they ever do that with Sean Dyche? Maybe if they can spend a bit of money and get players through the door, but I'm not sure if, if they even have that possibility to do that with the financial constraints that they do have. Um, it is a difficult one. You look at their team. Uh, they are. I think they got a better team than the play, than the teams around them. You're looking at the Lutons and Nottingham Forests and um, you know Sheffield United, Burnleys. I do think they have a better team than that. But do they have a better team with maybe the te other teams around them higher up? The Brentfords, the maybe Crystal Palace, probably Fulham. I don't know. So I mean, I kind of think they're at where they kind of deserve to be at the moment in terms of the players that they do have. Yeah, but going on such a long winless run, it's not going to breed like uh, excitement from the Everton fans, especially when you couple in the fact how they play as well. It uh, must be very frustrating to be an Everton fan at the moment. But I, on the positive side for them, I do think they'll remain in the league. And obviously, that, that uh, after having that point deduction, that was in serious threat. Although it's still only four points, and considering they haven't won in four months now, you know, you, no guarantees at the moment. I just think. Luton, Burnley and Sheffield United, you know, they're, they're probably even more inconsistent than them. But we'll see how it goes for Everton. A good point at St. James's Park, but they need to start getting a win. A massive, massive game this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on to Nottingham Forest against Fulham. It finished 3-1 to Forest. Forest finally get a win on the board. Sim went for 1-1. I went for 2-2. And something about Fulham going away from home, they're just shocking. Um, they're such a different team uh, when they're at home, when they're away from home. Albeit, um, I think Forrest went 3-0 up really early and, um, and he made a triple sub after like 20 minutes, half an hour. And it did kind of kind of changed things they I think in the second half they absolutely pummeled um, Nottingham Forest just couldn't get a blow down the house and get anything um, back in the game but you know you'll give credit to Nottingham Forest where they started the game and it ultimately won them the game yeah sloppy start cost Fulham really big result for Nottingham Forest in the in the battle for relegation they really needed these three points because uh, I think Nuno might have been starting to come under pressure with some of their results they were getting but Morgan Gibbs-White really stepped up from this game goal and assist and a really great performance Hudson Adoy is well on the score she with a with a really good piece of play and showing what he can do what the potential he has so I think Forrest will be delighted but as you say it was like a 
opening half an hour spurt and then um you know, once they got a free goal lead, uh, Fulham obviously made uh, a triple sub and um, things changed. But you could say maybe it changed because Forrest dropped off. They had the three goal lead and uh, they didn't really have to come out anymore. So it makes sense that, that you know, Fulham were going to dominate after that period. They did get a goal, but it wasn't enough. Once you got, you can't give any team in the Premier League a three goal advantage. So Marcus Hill would be really disappointed. But in terms of Forrest, uh, three point gap now team them and Luton. Um, so really, really big result there for them. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Bournemouth against Crystal Palace. Finished 1-0 to Bournemouth. Sim went for 1-0 to Palace. I went for 2-1 to Bournemouth. So I get a point on the board for this one. And I thought it was a deserved win for Bournemouth on the day. Crystal Palace really failed to thre um, threaten much. Failed to create too many chances. Bournemouth uh, kept probing, kept asking questions. And they got their goal in the end with Justin Clivert with around, I think, 15 minutes to go or something like that. So I think it was a deserved victory. Yeah, really disappointing for uh, Palace to not really um, show anything in this game, to be honest. They were really stifled by a very vibrant and on-form uh, Bournemouth team who I think now in the last five games, um, only the top three teams have got more points than them or the top two even, I should say. Sorry, no, sorry. I, I correct me. Uh, no team has got more points than them in the past five games. They're level with the top two, and off the back of they had a really poor run between you know December and um, uh, and and February. But since March, they've been on top top form, and Ira Ola is doing a fantastic job there. Really great win uh, for them, and makes them put them. Um, they're pushing now the top half of the table. So really, really impressive stuff from Bournemouth. Um, showing that they can go on multiple good runs under this manager. Palace, still no win since uh, uh, his first, uh, Gladstone's first game in charge. Mm. Um, so I would say, has it had the desired effect at this point? Not first game, second game in charge, I think it was. Um, Burnley was the first game, yeah, it was the first game. So it was the first game, yeah. So we won the first game 3-0 and, and the, they had to go down to 10 men, Burnley, to win that game. And since then, they haven't won a game. Um, uh, and two losses, two draws. So not much has changed, to be honest, results-wise. Maybe they're looking a bit better, but in the, on this evidence, it wasn't a great performance, to be honest, so yeah. not much has changed. Absolutely, and you're looking at the games that they have played, um, the last three games where they've dropped points, obviously a loss against Bournemouth, a draw against Luton, um, and a draw against Nottingham Forest. So two teams facing um, you know, the drop, and two teams who at that point were not on good form. So Palace should be picking up points against these kind of teams, especially with a new manager and a potential new manager bounce as well but then you also got to look at it like Glasner plays a completely different way to the way Hodgson plays the way previous management do play so maybe it's a case of he needs his own players in, in the summer he also needs to lose say back I think that's yeah. sure. <laughs> you know they're so reliant on Eze if you stop Eze you literally stop Palace we've got no other option at the moment yeah that's true but let's move on Burnley against Wolves it finished 1-1 Sim went for 1-0 to Burnley I went for 2-1 to Burnley but it did finish 1-1 and um, keeps Burnley's unbeaten run uh, going ticking over it was I think Burnley probably would have I wouldn't say expected a win but we both predicted wins for Burnley because of the good form that they have been on recently um, not getting over the line in terms of wins but getting really good draws you know away at Chelsea uh, there was another really impressive one in there as well and I think Burnley would probably be a bit disappointed that they didn't take all three points against a depleted Wolves side yeah big big missed opportunity for um, Burnley in my opinion having gone 1-0 up and um, playing a Wolves side without all their um, first choice attackers in, in the team you'd have to fancy your chances at that point to uh, go and get three points and what a big opportunity to really um, start pushing for, for safety and the fact that they you know conceded um, couldn't hang on to that lead and didn't really look like winning it in the second half it's got to be very very disappointing for uh, Vincent Kompany um, because that, look as much as they're unbeaten it's all well and good being unbeaten they need wins there's eight games there's seven games to go now for them um, they're, they're still six points behind now so draws don't really help them that much they need those three points and I feel if they don't beat but, uh, Everton on the weekend that could be the, that final nail in the coffin Mm. albeit we've said that before Berlin they seem to claw themselves back in a position albeit because of the points deduction that safety wasn't that far away but they have to beat uh, Everton this weekend if they don't if they fail to win I think that could be curtains for them and if they do win I mean it's all to play for from now until the end of the season it will make it incredibly tight when you're looking at the, the games this weekend you know Forest go to Spurs I'm not sure who Luton have but you know Luton um, you know are not getting themselves through any games at the moment. Bournemouth at so, home. Bournemouth at home, another incredibly difficult game. So, 
if Burnley can get the points this weekend, it's going to make it an almighty uh, finish of the season in terms of relegation, isn't it? Yeah. Um, next up is a London derby in East London, the London Stadium. West Ham won, Tottenham won. Both of us went for 2-2. Two, two, uh, so both of us get a point on the board here. I think um, the way we assessed it, I think a draw was probably a fair result. Spurs controlling the possession, um, not creating too many clear-cut chances throughout the game. West Ham probably having the better chances of the game on their counter-attacks. But um, yeah, I think both sides will probably accept that a draw was a fair result. Yeah, I think chances were a premium in this game. Spurs um, obviously took the lead early. It looked like they were really sharp. But unfortunately, um, uh, West Ham got a goal from a set piece against runner play. Kurt Zuma bouncing off his back and getting that equaliser. And then after that period, Spurs kind of huffed and puffed without really causing Fabianski too much trouble, albeit they had a few chances late on. And West Ham had maybe... Um, had a few chances on the counter, but not many. Antonio had a chance on a breakaway, which he should have scored. They had a chance from a corner, which uh, um, was saved by Vicario. Apart from that as well, they didn't have too many chances. So I think West Ham came to do a job on Spurs. Um, they came for a draw and they got that draw. And maybe West Ham fans seeing at home, um, you know, a home in a L London derby, they would like to maybe have seen West Ham go for a bit more. Um, but on the other hand, Moyes would argue to contain this Spurs side, you have to be very defensively resolute. And that's exactly what they were. So I think deserve point from both sides, but I think a, a result uh, which Tottenham will be frustrated by. Yeah, and you could see maybe the uh, reactions from both clubs after the game, which ones were more happy. You know, Spurs players looked really dejected walking off that pitch and David Moyes was saying after the game how much of a good point it was for them. So I think that tells you everything you need to know in terms of the ambitions of, um, of that football match. But let's move on to Arsenal. It finished 2-0 at the Emirates against Luton. Sim went for 3-0, I went for 4-0. So again... Both us getting a point on the board for this one. Arsenal uh, with a bit of a change side, you know, the likes of Reese Nelson playing and em Emil Smith Rowe, who had a really good game. Um, I mean, it was game over by half time, really. An own goal and Martin Odegaard put them on their way. And the second half was pretty much a non event. Yeah, um, obviously, Luton are really struggling for form at the moment. And. Uh Arsenal are not um, one to give away too many chances with their current form. So as soon as Arsenal took the lead, there was a air of it was uh, game over, really. Uh, Luton had a bit of a late rally with like 10 minutes to go. Looked like put Arsenal under a bit of pressure, but Arsenal pretty easily dealt with it. I don't think it was a great performance by Arsenal, but it didn't need to be. Um, in this kind of game, the whole point of it was to rest players. They started the likes of Reese Nelson, who doesn't usually get started um, this season. So the whole point was get give the, um, some of their main players who are playing a lot like Rice and Saka, give them a rest and try and get the three points without them. And that's exactly what they did. It didn't have to be the best performance. They got the 2-0 win and it's just a case of get the points and move on. I don't think it was the best performance, but uh, it just keeps them uh, keeps pace with the top three. Yeah. Next up, Brentford against Brighton. It finished 0-0 at the Brentford Community Stadium. Both of us going for 2-1 to Brentford in this game. Um, I thought Brighton were the ones in the ascendancy for most of the game, but probably should have got a goal. Brentford were fairly dangerous on the counter-attack, but didn't really create too much throughout the day and uh, finished 0-0. Yeah, uh, Brentford sat deep and um, it was really difficult for them to get out. I thought Brighton played a really good passing game in this one, keeping possession really effectively, albeit again uh, with the way Brentford defended, it was going to be very difficult for, for Brighton to create chances and so it told. They they probably did have the better chances. They'll be more, feel really disappointed they didn't win the game on the balance of play. Brentford had a few fleeting moments on the breakaway, but um, I think they'll be disappointed that they didn't trouble Brighton a bit more than they uh, usually do with the kind of way they play. So um, still maybe in Buemo, he came off the bench, so he's still kind of getting back to full fitness. He's going to be so important in that late run in. I don't think it was a bad performance. I think they've performed better recently. Um, I think they'll take the point and, and move on. But again, they still haven't um, won many games recently, so they still need to start getting some wins. But at the moment, six points clear of the relegation zone. So I don't think... Look, they're going to be concerned until they're further away, but I think they'll be all right this season. Yeah, I do think they'll be all right, but you've got to be frustrated if you're a Brentford fan because like, they put in these unbelievable performances, don't get over the line, and then you're thinking, all right, next game, they they got to get over the line. Then they just put in a bit of a... I wouldn't say terrible performance, but nowhere near as strong as maybe the previous and they don't get the win on the board again. And it's you've got to be frustrated, surely, if you're a Brentford fan. Yeah, and especially, I, th I think they usually get some draw against Brighton in previous games. Like, the way Brighton set up is pretty suited to, like, how Brentford like to exploit opposition. So the fact that they cause them very little trouble will be very frustrating for Thomas mm. Frank, I think. Let's go to the city of Manchester. Manchester City 4, Aston Villa 1 against the depleted Aston Villa side. Uh, both of us went for 2-1 to Man City, so 
say again we all get a point on the board I thought Man City were brilliant um, I really did I think it's their best performance in a while they absolutely pummeled Aston Villa I thought for the majority of the game and when Villa did go 1-1 it was massively against the run of play from Duran uh, Phil Foden getting a hat-trick unbelievable performance from him and Rodri with a goal and assist as well who I thought was absolutely brilliant on the day um, yeah Man City coming back to form really was the Phil Foden show and they had the luxury of resting Haaland and De Bruyne as well yeah. and still taking a good team like Aston Villa to the cleaners I think Aston Villa definitely did suffer without Ollie Watkins I felt like they didn't really have that focal point um, when they went forward uh, uh, anyone to play a, a long ball to and and uh, really hurt um, Man City so definitely his um, his absence was missed uh, by Aston Villa for sure but the fact I thought Man City completely dominated. I think Villa, even though uh, they didn't have Watkins, they'll be still a bit disappointed how little they troubled City. I know they did score, but it was completely against run of play. It was out of the blue and it was one of those just out of nothing goals. And uh, they did go in at um, half time. Well, they should have gone in at half time 1 1, but uh, that free kick from Phil Foden on the stroke of half time got them uh, Man City the lead. And I think Villa will be really angry. Emre will be furious, I think, with that free kick because it goes right through the wall. There's a massive gap between, I think it was um, Zaniolo and, and Rogers, I think it is, uh, in, made a big gap in that wall and it wasn't even a good free kick from Foden and the fact that uh, um, the players were cowardly in the way they separated will be will have Emery fuming and then obviously Foden um, clinical in, in the in the second half but what I want to say is <coughs> that assist from Rodri for the second goal unbelievable how is this guy doing this he's supposed to be like a, a defensive midfielder sitting but he's now got what like nine goals and something like eight assists like he's ridiculous his goal contributions are absolutely staggering and then he's doing assists like that where he's rolling it off from his right foot onto his left foot perfectly into the path of Foden who just had to take it first time and slot it into the corner unbelievable uh, from from Rodri honestly if he's not going to win player of the year um, I don't know who will because I think he has to he's just being that good um, and because he's not only is he getting these goal contributions but he's also by far the best of Entermid as well uh, doing that job and then that fourth goal for for City that Foden goal was uh, quite funny it was because Foden gets fouled I think anyway and he doesn't get the decision he's like screw this and he just goes and wins the ball back and just smashes it while slipping into the top corner from 25 yards absolutely astonishing uh, now 20 goals in all competition for him this season uh, unbelievable season he's having and uh, it's scary to think I think he's still only 22 isn't he so wow what what a uh, what a player he is. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of what you're saying about Rodri, I mean, this is the reason why he is the best midfielder in the world. I don't think any midfielder in world football can come close to him at the moment. And he um, plays every game. He never gets a rest as well. I think it goes to like, what is it? 60, over 60 64 games in all. unbeaten. I That's think. 64, no losses in a Man City it's, shirt. It's absolutely insane. Uh, and, he, and he just does everything. When and you need him see. to be a creator, he creates as well. It's but crazy. You can see, he is the glue to that Man City side because when they don't have him, they, they pretty much lose every time. That's what happened, isn't it? They, they, yeah, they went on a losing streak at the, beginning of the, uh, at the start of the season when he wasn't fit. So it's astonishing how much an influence and how good this guy is. I mean, when he signed for City, everyone knew he was a good player, but this is just another level. Like, I think he's making um, Sergio Busquets, you know, he, he putting that in a different conversation, I think. I think he might be better than him. Wow, that's big words. Rodri better than Sergio Busquets last night in the comment section below. Uh, but let's move on to Liverpool against Sheffield United. Finished 3 1 to Liverpool. It was the late, late show. Sim went for 3 1. So he gets a big fat five pointer here. I went for 4 0. And look. I thought Liverpool absolutely smashed them throughout the whole game. They just couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. They go 1-0 up. Sheffield United claw it back somehow. And then um, it took for Salah to go off uh, for Liverpool to go and uh, get those two late goals. To be fair to Sheffield United, in the first five minutes, they had two really yeah. massive chances, True. which they should have gone 1-0 up on. Um, so they'll feel annoyed that obviously they didn't take those moments. When you're Sheffield United going to Anfield, those are big moments. You have to take advantage of them. And they didn't. Um, obviously, a massive howler from the goalkeeper um, for Sheffield United. United uh, for the first goal, kicking it straight at Darwin Nunes, um, uh, which obviously um, went went right into the back of the net, and that'll be massively massively frustrating for Wilder because actually during the first half they defended pretty well, and I thought without that moment, um, I don't think they created too many real clear cut opportunities in that first half to be honest. So that moment really cost them um, to be honest. Sheffield United did somehow find a way back into the game, uh, where I thought Joe Gomez defending for that goal was really really bad, and Connor Bradley a bit of a um, bit of a bad luck ball bouncing in off him and Sheffield United looked like maybe they could cause a shock but 
I don't think um, anyone really believed they were going to hang on. And what a goal, what a hit from McAllister and what a signing he has been. He is really showing an ability uh, from long range to hit these uh, efforts right into the top bins uh, uh, fairly consistently. He's done it a few times out of the season. And I thought he was probably man of the match. I thought he had, it was a astonishing performance and um, it was a good reward for it. was a great, goal, great performance from him. And what a goal it was, just incredible. Uh, absolute howitzer. Uh, from from uh, McAllister and he's been one of the signings of the season for me and then obviously Gakpo wraps up late on so re a good win wasn't the best performance from Liverpool but um, just got over the line in these midweek games can be tricky you know when you're um, playing multiple times and teams are uh, making it difficult for you but um, really important win for them and uh, keeps on top of the table yeah, and uh, Alexis McAllister, I think that's four goals in his last six games in all competitions he, for Liverpool. I believe he's got a goal contribution in eight of, eight of his last nine games. Yeah, so I mean, he's, he's in incredible form. I was question. I, I mean, in terms of signing of the season or one of the signings of the season, I think recently he's starting to come into it, but I don't, like first half of the season, I wasn't that impressed with him. But second half, or definitely very recently in the last couple of months, he's definitely grown into that Liverpool shirt, that's for sure. I think he's stepped up recently to another level, but I think he's been great all season, in my mm. opinion. Let's move on to the game of the week. And that was Chelsea against Manchester United. 4-3 to Chelsea. Sim went for 2-1 to Chelsea. I went for 1-1. Uh, so Sim gets a point on the board here. But what a game this was. Um, Chelsea go 2 nil up really early. And you're, thinking, and you're fearing the worst for Man United. Man United turn it around, get 3-2 up. And then in the last minute, Chelsea turn it around again and score two goals in the last minute. But Chelsea's goals, I mean, two penalties for Cole Palmer and a massive deflection in the last Last minute uh, you're looking at the one of the Man United goals as well that assist from Anthony uh, was one of the best assists you're going to see all season from a player that's been shocking all season so um, the way I assess this game I, I just thought it was two terrible teams just going at each other basically that it wasn't a game of like massively high quality it was just like really two poor ties just basically going at each other it was basically two sides who only play on the counter and can't defend counters basically yeah. that's exactly what there it was, was no elements of literally. control at all in this game there was no midfield pretty much it was pretty much one team attacks the other team attacks and no team could uh, stop the other team basically from creating chances and it was thrilling to watch and I absolutely loved every second of it but it was not good quality I think everyone yeah. can say that and also the mistakes uh, both sides made were absolutely atrocious and it's probably an example of why both teams have been so inconsistent um, this season when Chelsea went roared into like a two goal lead early on I thought wow you know uh, Chelsea at home under Pochettino met, you know good before uh, playing really well I thought their home form recently He's also been quite good, you know, apart from that Burnley result. So I was like, okay, they're really starting to show something here. Really important 2 0 lead, but it all kind of flipped. I didn't think Man United were in the game, but then Caicedo just plays Garnacho for on goal out of nothing. Really horrible mistake. The momentum just kind of switched. Uh, all of a sudden, United got back level just for half time and then even took the lead with, as you say, probably one of the assists of the season with Anthony. And not only is that one of the assists of the season, it's his first assist of the season, <laughs> which is incredible. Um, just goes to show what an awful season he's having even though that is evidence of the quality he does have but really great assist and a great finish from Garnacho and I thought to be honest Chelsea were terrible in that second half I thought Man United really controlled the game in that second half um, and Chelsea for some reason there's always a massive drop off from them in the second half I think um, I read a stat if you took just their second half results this season they'll be in the relegation zone so it's quite incredible how poor they've been but where would they be if you just take the first halves I think uh, a lot higher, like, yeah, yeah in, the, in European spots. So uh, they're really a, a Jekyll and high team. But to be fair to them, they didn't give up. Poch made some subs. Madueke came on, earned the penalty, which Palmer slotted home. And then um, Man United, I, I've said, I've seen this so many times. They just have this tendency of late in games just giving away uh, goals. And even if they even if they score goals late on, they still have a tendency to concede as well. It's, it's absolutely crazy, the late drama that involves Man United. And to concede two goals like that um, would be heartbreaking but they've only got themselves to blame there's this really great picture of um, the corner that Man United conceded late on and um, they've, there's about four Man United players all pointing at Palmer yet no one goes to him they're all pointing at him but yeah. no one actually goes to him and Palmer ends up getting the ball and getting a shot off and scoring the goal um, so brilliant win from Chelsea even though it wasn't a great performance but Man United this is more yet more evidence of their lack of control in games and their also fallibility late on because they concede so many late goals 
the Pochettino celebration at the end, um, uh, at the final whistle, did remind me a bit of his celebration when uh, we beat Aston Villa with that last uh, late goal with Harry Kane with the free kick. So do you reckon that's a, a game and a, a win that kind of saves his job or goes close to saving his job? Well, I think if they, if they lost that 3-2, he would on be under serious pressure because they would be sitting here in uh, in 12th at the moment, only a point behind, a uh, point above 13th as well. So if they didn't get that win, I mean, the knives will really be out. He did look, there was a mixture of like jubilation and relief in that celebration. You could definitely see that. He was definitely like, I've never seen a, a manager so happy to go from like 12th to 10th in my life. <laughs> so I think if that, that was a big indication that he needed that win for sure. Um, I don't know if they would have sacked him, but I think um, maybe there would have been a decision made about whether he's going to be here next season for sure. Mm. Um, tenth in the league, but they, you know, still fighting for those uh, European spots with a game in hand, two games in hand on West Ham. Five um, points, five points off, behind it, six. so they're not exactly miles off it. Five points off six, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So like with a game in hand. Yeah, with a game in hand, so they're not totally out of the Europa League spots for sure. And um, I think Chelsea are playing better than Man United, even though Man United have got more results than them. I do, I do think Chelsea play better, but Chelsea because of their youth and everything and also maybe they're struggling to adjust to Poch's intense system that's led to a lot of drop points in the second half of games but I do think structurally and things like that they're, they're better off than Man United funnily enough I look at Man United and uh, and the majority of times that they win or get the points I just come away feeling like you lucky bastards you know what I mean because like how like that game against Brentford was a clear example of it like they should have been four or five nil down and how many times this season have you walked away from the game being like how the hell have Man United got, Man United got away with this and it would have been the same yesterday if they yeah. would have won uh, yeah. every time they win I'm never impressed yeah. uh, and uh, I think they I think they don't deserve to be in Europe next season the way they've played this season in my opinion the, the only way they'll make it is due to their individual quality they do have because they've got good players, but I think Ten Hag is not doing a good job. Yeah, and Rasmus Hoyland was on absolute fire before the injury, spent a couple of games out and uh, can't find the back of the net again. Yeah, needs to start. Uh, look, I think he's a good striker, uh, but clearly he's playing on confidence and at the moment he's got little. Mm. Let's finish off talking about our star men. It was a Liverpool head-to-head. -head. Didn't pan out the way we expected. It wasn't an onslaught like maybe uh, one thought. Same went for Mo Salah. Zero goals, zero assists. That Salah card has been used with zero points. He got taken off with, what, half an hour, 25 minutes to uh, go one all. Something. They just scored. Just after they uh, Sheffield United just scored, they, they took him off straight away. So gutting um, wasted my salad card but some more big hitters to come yeah I went for Luis Diaz who got the probably the assist of the season I would say assist of the uh, season. for Alexis McAllister's goal uh, it was all Diaz that goal yeah, let's be honest uh, so yeah I get two points for this so it leaves a 10 point gap going into the weekend of Premier League fixtures um, 362 to 352 we see how it goes this weekend uh, Premier League predictions to come a bit later on today and yeah thank you everyone for joining us today we'll see you next time